Just moments ago in Moscow, a major escalation in Russia's war. Vladimir Putin illegally annexing occupied Ukrainian territories. I'll remind viewers again, illegally. It's a move that world leaders say will not be acknowledged. I want uh, the Kiev authorities and their real masters in the West to hear me and remember those, those people who live in these four regions are becoming our citizens forever. We are calling on the Kiev regime to immediately cease fire and all military actions and the war they started back in 2014 and returned to the negotiation table. We are prepared to this, but the choice of the people in the four provinces we are not going to discuss. Uh, Russia is not going to betray it. Joining me now is CNN senior international correspondent Matthew Chance and CNN senior security editor Nick Payton Walsh. Matthew, you're here with me on set. So this was anticipated. What's interesting is that we had seen that rapid speed counteroffensive by the Ukrainians to avoid just this earlier this month. All of that having been said, Vladimir Putin doubles down and follows up on this annexation. What happens next? Yeah, and it, it's probably because of that rapid advance by Ukrainian forces on the ground, which I think Nick's going to talk to you about in a minute, um, that Vladimir Putin has brought forward these referenda in these four regions uh, of Ukraine uh, to really kind of send a powerful message, both to his domestic audience uh, in Russia and to international observers as well, that he is going to do this. He's determined to do it despite the fact that he doesn't control vast areas of territory that is about to annex. I mean, um, you know, he's now made this speech in Moscow, which is the first step in four, well, not the first step, but one of the next step in formally annexing uh, these territories. He said there are now four new regions of Russia. He also called on Kiev, uh, on the authorities in Ukraine, to come back to the negotiating table. But he made it clear that even though Russia was looking for a peace deal, these regions would not be up for negotiation. He said that these people will be in Russia forever. I'm slightly paraphrasing yeah. it here, but you know, he has drawn Russia's red line. Of course, what we also know is that Vladimir Putin has declared openly that he will defend these territories as if they are part of Mother Russia it, you know, with the nuclear weapons that he's got if he deems it to be necessary. And Nick, I want to bring you in to talk about the, the counteroffensive that continues to play out there on the part of the Ukrainians. We have Vladimir Putin lying to the public, lying to the world, uh, saying that this is now part of Mother Russia. Uh, President Zelensky had said since day one, if, these, if this happens, if there is a referendum, if there's an annexation, there is no turning back. He is not going to the negotiation table. So what happens next in terms of any possible talks between these two sides? I think that prospect is uh, pretty remote. And this seems to be the Kremlin's big play here, judging from the main takeaway from a speech that was predominantly a, a revisionist history, again painting Russia as a victim from Western uh, imperialism, essentially accusing the West of exactly what Russia's doing here. He's essentially saying, let's have a unilateral ceasefire here, let's stop fighting, let's go to the negotiating table. Now, it's fair to say that in the past, Russia has used diplomacy as a time for a military pause to regroup or to continue to pursue its military objectives. And that's why Washington, the EU, you and Kiev have pretty firmly rejected Russian diplomacy as something that doesn't engage with in earnest. But it seems to be holding that out here uh, with the background threat, as you just heard, of possible nuclear force, something that, of course, everyone should treat as remote and the last horrifying idea, but in the background during all of this. I have to say, looking at the crowd during some of that speech, there weren't that many convinced faces because they know that on the ground here in Ukraine, as Russia announces these new areas of its territory, the parts of that which Ukraine controls is growing hour by hour. Now, importantly, in Luhansk, one of the four regions, which they just said is part of Russia, they are on the verge of seeing a key town, a railway hub called Lyman, which has possibly thousands of some of Russia's best troops in it. That seems to be encircled almost or close to being encircled by a rapid and very methodical Ukrainian advance that we've seen how it's burst through the countryside here over the past weeks. It's continuing
continuing to do that in other areas around Luhansk. And so the notion suddenly that these areas are now just an indisputable part of Russia legally is, of course, absurd, but it's also practically on the ground, being dismantled slowly hour by hour. And there are some seeing this potential encirclement around Le Mans as the possibility for yet another Russian collapse, like we saw around the second city of Kharkiv just weeks ago. Supply lines were hit, the Russian army ran. That's not impossible here. And so Putin is giving us this extraordinary vision of a Russia under threat that now is declaring its territory expanded to protect citizens that it considers it has the right to offer protection to. But at the same time, its conventional forces have been failing here for weeks. Its partial mobilization has succeeded in sending over 200,000 Russians out of Russia to avoid it. But we haven't seen tens of thousands of properly equipped troops here at all to alter the dynamics on the battlefield. And so we're in this dangerous dangerous moment where Russia seems to have played its card, said these are now parts of Russia, do not touch them or we reserve the right to do anything to defend them. It's called internationally perhaps now for more diplomacy, but that looks likely to be rejected. And we're now left in the, well, what else? moment where Ukraine continues to yeah. go forwards because Russia doesn't seem to have conventional forces here that change things. Matthew, looking at that room, it looks anything but celebratory in terms of those officials who Vladimir Putin is addressing. This is supposed to be a, a day of jubilation that he would like to copy what happened in 2014 when he annexed Crimea. Clearly, the situation is different right now. A rare admission uh, of mistakes being made yesterday that, that struck me in terms of the partial mobilization of troops in Russia. And you've seen throughout the country, as we just heard, that many hundreds of thousands, perhaps uh, men, ha have been trying to leave because there is concern just about the number of men who have been called up for duty. Yeah, I mean, look, this, this whole adventure from the Kremlin's point of view has been misstep after misstep. And it's just incredible looking at the faces of the men and women in this, in this audience, in the Kremlin, as Vladimir Putin gives this, this speech, which is meant to be, as you say, a, a celebration of the homecoming of, of these broken away parts of Russia as they see it. Everyone's got a blank expression on their face because they know what the cost has been so far to the country and what it's going to be. Because one of the things he said is, look, it was almost kind of unbelievable. He was like, we're going to rebuild the destroyed cities. We're going to make these regions prosperous again. And you know, there wasn't a glimmer of agreement on those people's yeah. faces. They are sitting there because they've been told to sit there and nod their heads. And I think- These are some of the poorest regions of Ukraine, we should note as well, especially there in Donbass. Well, well they're, they're the industrial regions. Uh, they've, got, they've got industrial potential, but I mean, they've been devastated over the past seven months. They've been laid to waste, these areas. And you know, it is gonna be a burden on any country, let alone one like Russia, to rebuild them. And we shouldn't look lightly on that nuclear threat that he continues no. to dangle. He says he's bluffing. Hopefully we won't see that day, but nonetheless, um, it's across the Rubicon here. We can say that for sure. Uh, good to have you on set with us. Matthew Chance, Nick Peyton Walsh, I'll thank you to you.